to Strange Form. Today we are going to be looking at not one, but three of Hot Toys Back to the Future collectibles. Having been a fan of the series since the first film hit theaters when I was but a boy, I've spent many years kicking myself for not picking up the first iteration of the DeLorean time machine. That being said, my favorite version of the vehicle has always been Back to the Future 2's hover conversion model, so when Hot Toys announced this item, I made certain that I wouldn't miss it a second time around. But you can't have a DeLorean time machine without Doc and Marty. And though frustrating they released the Part 1 figures alongside the Part 2 time machine, and vice versa for the previous release, I find the prospect of having a lonely time machine even more frustrating than mismatched costumes. And because I now have a time machine, I know that tragedy awaits. So stay tuned to see what happens. So let's get started with Hot Toys Marty McFly and Deluxe Edition Dr. Emmett Brown. As per usual, with Hot Toys, the packaging is slick and well-produced, featuring the movie poster for Marty, an image you can't recreate with a figure, unfortunately, and I will get into why in just a second. As for Doc, you have the time machine being rolled out of the truck trailer, an interesting image, if not a little bit out of place when compared to Marty's packaging, but it could be easily used as a diorama display piece. I can already tell that having the Back to the Future 1 figure displayed next to the Part 2 DeLorean is going to annoy me more than I thought, especially as a completionist. But I will talk about what Hot Toys could have done to address this in just a moment. As I'm sure many of you know, this is not the first time this figure has been released. Several years ago, there was a Back to the Future 1 Marty McFly that came with a pair of sunglasses as opposed to Einstein. In all honesty, I would rather Einstein come with Doc Brown, and this version include the sunglasses as well as an electric guitar. This one does appear to have a much improved face sculpt and costuming, though. As a matter of fact, right out of the box, I'm pretty sure if Hot Toys or anyone else released a costume change for this figure, I would prefer it to the original Part 2 head sculpt. The company really has come a long way in the last decade. Included here is the VHS camcorder, Einstein, Marty's East Pack backpack, the Save the Clock Tower flyer, and a cassette deck with headphones. Oh, and of course, his very 80s looking skateboard as well as a waist-grabbing stand, and three extra sets of hands to round everything off. Again, missing is the pair of sunglasses. From the face sculpt to the embroidery on the costuming, this figure is shockingly accurate, and is among one of the best figures Hot Toys has ever released. The accessories are spot-on, with micro-detail that makes them look far more fragile than they actually are. And the costuming is so well tailored, I swear I can hear the power of love playing softly on a breeze somewhere. In short, despite not having an electric guitar or sunglasses, this figure is the high watermark for the company, and definitely worth picking up for the discriminating Back to the Future fan. And then we have Doc Brown, with a face sculpt they decided not to feature on the box. This figure does not appear to have a different head sculpt than its Back to the Future Part 2 counterpart, or at least is a slight retooling of that figure. I'm happy to see that the Part 3 figure is getting a different expression, but one of the issues going this direction with the face sculpt is that the figure has limited display options. He's not quite fully surprised, but he's definitely not neutral either. He does come with an incredible amount of accessories, including many delicate paper parts, which doesn't seem like the best choice, and I wish these parts had been a light plastic instead. As I now have a time machine, I foresee them degrading in the future. I do love the detail in the utility belt, as well as the remote control. And the part that makes this the special edition is the inclusion of the radioactive fuel cell box, which is a fun accessory, but doesn't qualify the price increase. He also comes with a stopwatch accessory that belongs to Einstein. Again, I wish Doc came with Einstein, and Marty got the electric guitar. When all is said and done, Doc isn't a terrible figure, though, and the details in the costume are quite incredible. He just doesn't live up to what they accomplished with Marty, but they still make a good team when displayed together and I have my fingers crossed that maybe we will get a retooling of their Back to the Future Part 2 versions. But now we come to the main event, and if you follow me on social media, you probably already know where this is going, and you definitely want to stay tuned to the end to see my assessment of how this vehicle accessory went wrong, and the heartbreak that ensued. But let's let past me have some fun with it before we break his heart. I mean, look at him, so full of hope. As per usual, Sideshow didn't have any extra packaging, so when this thing arrived on my front porch, it's pretty much going to tell everyone in the neighborhood what I just bought. As unlike the previous release, the brown shipper box is the only art box. 
inside is simply a styrofoam container held in place with two large velcro straps to make up for the lack of an art box there's a large poster like insert covering the accessories on the top level beneath the poster is a large art print of the delorean with the instructions printed on the opposing side inside you have the back to the future bike seat or display stand the front and back flux bands and its clear plastic support posts and of course the mr fusion fuel port and dashboard alarm clock. Underneath the first tray, you have the vehicle itself. It's hard to describe the feeling of seeing this thing in person. When I was a kid, there was a neighbor down the street who had a DeLorean, and every time he came home, all the neighborhood children would circle around with their bikes and just stare at it, waiting for the adventure to begin. Now let's build the support base. Unfortunately, this is a rather dry plastic piece. I think that they missed an opportunity to have either a logo or at the very least a small plaque saying something along the lines of DeLorean Time Machine. Each one of the little plastic girders plugs into the corresponding holes on the base. And then you have the second stage for the tilted front and back supports for the DeLorean. My first impression is that these are extremely light pieces to be supporting such an expensive and heavy figure. I'm a little worried about these splitting over time where one pegs into the other, but we shall see, I suppose. Now, with the base complete, it's time to start assembling the time machine. It's surprisingly heavy, and there's more play inside the styrofoam packaging than I would like to see in a vehicle this fragile. But more on that at the end. This is the first time that I'm unpackaging the DeLorean, and I want you all to take note of the small black piece of plastic inside the DeLorean packaging, as well as the small plastic hose that has come free in transit. Here's where I'm beginning to see why some of the quality control issues have cropped up. There is so much loose room inside the packaging that one good jolt from a careless UPS employee could easily dislodge the glue from, let's say, the seats, or in my case, break free one of the glued hoses on the back of the vehicle. To keep scuffing from happening in transit, there is cling material on the front windshield, as well as both side windshields, and on both mirrors, something that I haven't seen many reviewers take off. The mirror material is difficult to get a hold of, and you'll probably need a very thin and sharp piece of tweezers to get it. Here on the back, you can see where the plastic hose came free. The other one is so well secured that it's hard to understand how this one could have dislodged itself in transit. But I'm glad that I caught it before turning the styrofoam packaging over and flinging it into oblivion. The flux bands on the back are easy to insert, but the wires and tubing need to be run underneath many of the hoses to be anywhere near film accurate. This is a delicate process and can lead to damage if you're not careful. When you go to attach the flux band at the bottom rear of the car, you're going to be tempted to peg it into position and then attach the hose and cable. Don't do this as you risk breaking off the cable attachments. Instead, plug them both into the ports and then seat the part afterwards. Doing this will save you the headache of trying to fiddle with the delicate parts. On the front, I found the inverse to be true, as it was easier to attach the flux band and then seat the cables. After that, you're ready for Mr. Fusion. The piece simply slots into the four holes on the back of the car, and here is where there is an incredible missed opportunity. I think Hot Toys could have really ingratiated themselves to fans by allowing the Mark II to be displayed also as the Mark I. All they would have needed to have done is make the plastic shell piece under Mr. Fusion removable, and included a nuclear fusion port that plugs in beneath it. Just adding that little conversion and magnetically interchangeable license plates would have caused some collectors to actually purchase two. And this version is definitely superior to the Mark I release. Now with the alarm clock in position on the dashboard, the Mark II is complete. Out of the box, the vehicle has an extremely impressive fit and finish, and nearly perfect paint applications, though they're spattering all over the tires and the undercarriage. I don't know why they made this the muddy back road DeLorean. And one thing I noticed about the wheels is that they don't seem to be designed to roll freely, meaning that the thing pretty much wants to stay put, and never really budged when I put it on the turntable, even while spinning. For me, there are only three motor vehicles that elicit this level of nostalgia. The 1989 Batmobile, Ecto-1, and this incredible part of motion picture history right here. And it's incredible to live in a time where all three are being produced in 1-6 scale for collectors. And now with the vehicle on its display base, I chose to carefully pull the wheels out to display it in hover mode. 
As per the instructions, I grabbed the tires and pulled straight out, only turning the tire down when it couldn't be extended any further, then repeated the process on the back. After pulling the back tire out, I could feel there was an issue, and inspected it off camera, then comparing it against the passenger side rear tire before pulling it out. And what I found is that both had stress damage. This evidently is a widespread issue that I will address and explain in a few minutes. You have two choices to power the vehicle, a USB Type-C port underneath, or the battery compartment underneath the hood, which is cleverly hidden under a spare tire. This is also where the three-stage power activation button is. An interesting aside is that the time readout is set to 1955 as present, and I'm sort of disappointed that they didn't set it to 2015, but it is interesting that the designation date is 1885, so I guess to properly display this, you're going to have to have streamers of little flags hanging off the back. Everything else in the interior looks great. The flux capacitor is bright enough to be seen through the windshield, and the animation adds an incredible dimension of flare. And I can't see anyone wanting to display this long term in any other position than flight mode. The angle Hot Toys chose for the vehicle display has an aggressive air and reminds me of the Universal Studios, now defunct Back to the Future ride. And were there not a glaring quality control issue with this vehicle, my main complaint would have just been that they missed an opportunity to have it displayed in both first and second movie version. And Hot Toys did in fact listen to the fans by correcting the look of the hover mode but I feel that's probably what got us into trouble here. The very part that Hot Toys was asked to change is the part that is currently failing on many of the units. And even with that last-minute retooling, the vehicle was rushed to market ahead of schedule, and though it is possible, I don't really foresee a recall in the near future, as that hasn't really been Hot Toys' way of dealing with quality control issues. From rotting rubber, to joints that are already broken in the package, Hot Toys has never been one to offer much of a solution to fixing issues such as these, almost always leaving it to the distributor. I would not want to be in Sideshow shoes right now. So as of now, I have in my possession a micro-machine vehicle that has lasted 33 years, and several children who just wanted to see it for a minute, and they of course promised that they would give it right back. And an adult collectible that didn't even last 33 minutes. So why did it fail? Well, after going over it with a fine-tooth comb, I think I have the answer. It would appear to be a combination of a failure-prone design and impact damage from shipping. Let me explain. The hinge they developed appears to be tension-based with a friction drag between seating positions, and the crack here is exactly in line with the bearing's travel between one seating position and the other. When you transform the vehicle from drive position to hover position, there is an incredible amount of tension pushing out on the small plastic piece. And if you look at the stress lines on the other wheels, you can see that it follows the exact same path, and this doesn't seem to be much different from any of the broken parts that I've seen in the forums and YouTube videos. And if you look closely, you can see that the split was there from the very first time that I converted the tire into the horizontal position. As I caught it on video, I could feel that there was something wrong with it as the tire moved from one position to the other, prompting me to check the other side before moving it into position. If you recall earlier, I pointed out a small black piece of plastic that was loose in the styrofoam packaging. I was able to trace this little broken shard all the way back to the wheel joint in question. In other words, it and that small plastic hose came off in shipping. Now you can see here that the joint, that was only used once, is digging a groove into the plastic, and is actually shaving parts of the interior off with each small movement. And in the next shot, you can see the tensioner piece on the exact path the crack took. Unfortunately, I think this is a problem that we all accidentally asked for, in that I'm fairly sure that Hot Toys changed the design of hover mode to accommodate us because of customer pushback on the original design. But in the time crunch, I'm fairly sure that they came up with an inferior hinge that will put stress on the joint in normal driving position, i.e. the weight of the vehicle being on all four of the tires, is going to push into this hinge, probably going a long way towards why it doesn't like to roll. But I think the issue will also present itself in hover mode, or more to the point, any time you convert it to hover mode. As even if you shore up the design with weld bond, as I've seen some people do, the hinge is still going to be digging out the inside every single time you move it from one position to the other. Eventually, it's going to become loose, even with limited use. But I don't think that's the only issue here. If you recall, mine was broken right out of the box, which led me to look at how snugly it was packaged or lack thereof. And to my shock, I found that the styrofoam packaging actually has quite a bit of play 
causing the vehicle to rock back and forth with this much shifting in transit. Any drop or heavy thud will transfer all of that energy to the vehicle, meaning I'm not entirely surprised people are receiving these with loose seats or damage to the fit and finish. I think part of the issue could be negated if Sideshow shipped the item in a larger box with more cushioning, but that doesn't solve the problem of the main design flaw. That plastic is simply too thin and too brittle to withstand the flex put on it by moving the tensioner piece. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if a whole lot of these go bad this summer when parts soften up a bit and expand in the heat. Now I hope you all enjoyed this episode of Strange Form and will show your support by liking, commenting, and of course subscribing. And remember, never stop collecting.